Heidegger stuff. In fact, Stuart doesn't like the, the new stages I've made in the skill model, which is really the way they come together. It's funny. Okay, now, um, I have well, to think sure, more. Because I think the new stages are what brings them together, right? Is that what well, well now the next stage will bring them together. Uh, you'll see. Okay. I, 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 this may not work this time, but it doesn't matter. We'll Let's erase try. it. We got yeah, time. <laughs> we got time. We'll try it. Okay. Sit up a little higher. Yeah, yeah. Now, so far, what we've looked at is, just, is the fifth stage called expert, in which the expert doesn't solve problems, the expert doesn't consult rules, the expert doesn't uh, uh, think about anything at all. The expert just does what normally works, and it naturally normally works. But already when you get there and it may sound like the, you might you could easily build a computer to do this or that this is just a kind of mechanical associationist model as opposed to the rules which is a, a mentalist model and they're both presumably equally wrong but how do you tell well you we've already seen that can you put that a little bit in simpler language yeah. about the mechanist model like say like it might look like we're we just have a bunch of all the, the mechanist model says it's, it's the behaviorist psychological associationism. We just got this whole bunch of, uh, of repertoire of situational kind of pictures in our, stored in our brain. Uh, Stuart and I tried to think about it that way. We said holograms in, in our early version of our book. And then you get the one that comes in when you perceive and it's attached to a move and you just do it. And, that's not going to work uh, because already the, the, it's important that it was already had to require a certain amount of involvement of the whole person to acquire this skill, even to get beyond competence to get to this kind of holism, which is already a, not a normal computer kind of picture because it's a top-down picture that it's the whole pattern which determines what is relevant and pulls you to do a particular thing. But that's not the, the really uh, important answer to the thinking of it either. Remember, the, you, the, there's the mechanical model and uh, that's already question... Uh, uh, no, never mind. I'll skip that. So the, the, the next stage is the thing to think about. After expert, you can see something interesting happening. Um, there are people who are better than experts. What is it like to be better than an expert? Well, it's somebody who has a sense of the whole situation and how it's developing in a way that enables them to respond in a more subtle, more uh, appropriate way than just being an expert. And what would that look like? Well, an expert would be somebody who, once they got good at doing things in a sort of standard way, but always in a sort of improvisatory way, because each situation is specific, but they would get so that they could just like a mechanism practically. Automatically their hand would just go out and they would do the right thing or throw the basketball to the right person and so forth. And that, and they could rest on their laurels at that and not constantly learn more, not constantly feel bad if they did something that didn't work and good if it did work. And then, and that's, most people are like that. Even the people who play good music or good basketball or make good pots and, or, or my colleagues who are good teachers. But there's something beyond it. If somebody is really identified with the, what they're doing so that it's who they are to be a chess master or a teacher or a, or a potter or a musician or something, then presumably they will be finding out who they are by what they're doing and it will t be, their identity will be at stake in what they're doing. And then they will just naturally feel good or bad about every time something happens which is surprisingly good or bad in their, in their skill. And they, and they will be sort of, another way to put it is they will be defining themselves in terms of the internal goods of the game or of the art. They will have a sense of what it really is to play basketball or to make paintings or whatever. And they will, there are two things. So they will see the deep 
good of the practice of the domain, and they will get their identity by trying to further and express in their lives the, what is special about that, that practice and devote themselves. When they do, they get better and better, unlike an expert who just stays expert. And my favorite example of that, but there you could find them in any domain, is Larry Bird, who apparently was so good in basketball that nobody else could understand, and of course he couldn't understand either, how he did it, that he could pass the ball to whoever was the right person in the right freedom, moving in the right direction. And he says in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an interview that he uh, didn't know what he was doing and he only realized uh, sometimes after he had done it that he'd passed the ball at all. But what went into that was not just some sort of brute, dumb, mechanical response, but a very, very subtle response to the whole sort of meaning of a developing basketball game, which he could have because he identified himself as a basketball player and took a stand on himself as a basketball player through his constant devotion to doing it. And so he would go home, presumably, and brood about something that went wrong or go home feeling great about it. I sort of know this from being a teacher. I mean, it makes a big difference to me how my class went. And presumably, I won't make the mistakes, the kind of mistake I made when it went badly, if I just brood about it. It's, it's very... Brooding is brood, definitely like an, an inner mental process. That's right. Process, that's right? all right. Does yes, you just... No, you just feel bad about it. I think that's okay. But, but, I, but here's what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't... And th this will stop you at competence or, sh or even before expert, I've mentioned it. Try to figure out what went wrong and make yourself a rule, don't do that again. Stuart has an example. If you're pulling out of a parking place and get sideswiped by a car, you can get so upset about it that you make yourself the rule, never pull out of a parking place without checking carefully in the rearview mirror to see that no car is coming. And that's a good thing to have. And that'll make you a competent and safe driver. But it will make you a rigid kind of driver under no situation. Even if there's no cars for a mile behind you, could you drive, pull out of a parking space without looking carefully in the mirror to make sure there's nobody behind you? you and that just means you're not adapting to the situation. And you'll never be an expert. But let's go back to the, the, the master, like Larry Bird. It's, it's only a human being can have, it's not a mechanical thing that makes him a master. It's the sense of the, the real truth of the domain, the dedication to bringing out the truth of the domain, the identifying of themselves as, uh, as a practitioner of that domain that makes them able to acquire the experience to do this kind of thing that most people wouldn't do and won't even understand why it's being done, but when it's done, people will say, ah, yeah, they see, that was the right thing to do. And so let's call that mastery. And it's intimately tied up with being a full human being. By the way, you need another thing I forgot to mention. To even get to expert, you need to have a sense that the standard way of doing things is not the best way of doing things. And that might be a kind of anxiety in Heidegger terms. That is, you realize that there's no ground for the rules, the routines, the standard ways of doing things that most people have. And that frees you up to respond to the unique situation. And so every expert must have, I would think, at least in the domain where they're the expert, a sense of the, uh, the ungroundedness uh, that there isn't, that, that the way that everybody thinks is obviously the right way to do things has nothing behind it that makes it the right way to do things except the illusion that everybody says to everybody else that's the right way to do it. Now, let's go one step further beyond the, the master. There's something even more interesting and requires something, I think, sort of mysterious. I don't have much to say about it. I mean, we can talk about how you identify yourself with being a musician or a teacher, and I feel I do it. And we can talk about how you suffer uh, continuously from your failures and 
elate and are always elated by your successes, I think I do that. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, there is something we could call a world discloser that changes the game, that makes a difference which at first will seem to people either crazy or outrageous, like, again, Picasso painting in Cubist's things, or Cezanne painting his strange pictures, which seemed to be like he was trying to get objects straight, but they never, the objects were never like, when you looked at them carefully, like they, they looked when you didn't, when you looked at them in, as a whole. I mean, and there are all kinds of such innovators. Uh, the latest, which I just saw, and you just saw too on, on television, is uh, a perfect example, is Bob Dylan, who didn't just get to be an expert at playing the guitar and the harmonica and uh, or even a master at playing the guitar and the harmonica. He actually changed the way folk music was written and sung and the way, I presume probably, the way the guitar and the harmonica were, when they were brought in and how they were brought in and then he even changed from there to the, from acoustic to electric guitar and at each point because people said, oh, you're, this is outrageous, this is crazy, you're betraying the domain, you, are, you can't do that. And you, you, there, there's a lot of out, the general outrage. But in the end, people come around and see, yeah, you, could, you can do the game that way too, and in a certain way that's more interesting. Hello? Yes, Nat? <laughs> that's fine, we are too. So don't feel pressed. Let's just get there at 10 after. Is that what you're thinking? Okay. See you then. Bye. I have all these people terrified at being prompt. Matt says he might be six minutes late. <laughs> uh, That's perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So let me see now. Oh, yeah. I wanted to give another example. I talked about Dylan. Oh, in basketball, for instance, it's really interesting and sort of clear. There are experts in basketball. I don't know their names. Uh, and then there are uh, masters like Larry Bird, but uh, then there are innovators. Larry Bird didn't change the game, but apparently, well now what's his name? Uh, Michael Jordan? Yes, Michael Jordan changed the game, apparently playing it in a, as an individual sort of competitive thing instead of as a team thing and trying to make as many baskets himself as possible and everybody said that was outrageous and that was undermined the game completely but somehow that gets assimilated in and changes the way basketball is played that's I don't I mean I find it mysterious because it's more than just identifying yourself with the game it's more than under being true to the inner nature of whatever the domain is. Uh, what it is that enables you to be a world disclosing person, I don't really know. It's something that uh, only some people are sensitive to it. You've got to be in anxiety. You've got to be unsatisfied with just being an expert, committed to being a master, but then something will just, you and open to, to doing something which will seem crazy to you and everybody else. And if you've got all that, and talent and luck, I would think, too, you can be a world discloser. And of course, no machine, no computer will ever do that. So it's the, yeah, it's not, it seems like the culture requires some of the, these shifts every once in a while, and then somebody happens to be receptive enough to make it happen, no? I mean, That's right. Something on the level of the culture, these people are sensitive to something that Heidegger calls something in the practices is changing, the style of the practices, something new is moving in on us, to talk like Heidegger. So at the end of the Middle Ages, Galileo was doing interesting new scientific experiments. Gutenberg had discovered the printing press. Luther had said that every man is a pope. That finally Descartes comes along and says we are, each one of us, a completely a autonomous mind with total freedom and utter responsibility and defines uh, modernity. It begins to describe what a modern person is. Uh, and then Kant comes along and really nails it. I think it takes two to be really world disclosers on this highest level of world disclosing. Then Kant comes along and says, ah, modernity means autonomy, that we give the law to ourselves, that we are totally the source of all meaning and order in the universe, and you define a whole new understanding of 
human being. But that's what it is to be a really super world discloser. Uh, what's Heidegger? Is Heidegger a super super world discloser? <laughs> Well, now Heidegger is yeah, he's not a he's a meta world discloser. I mean, he's the one who, instead of disclosing a new world, sort of had a new way of looking at everything as a history of a series of world disclosings, and that certainly changed the game in philosophy and amazingly enough in so many other disciplines. Who all of them claim they owe so much to Heidegger, whether it's architecture or economic. Well, not nobody's done it in economics yet, but. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. Lots of lots of them. So let me. But let me. There was one more thing I wanted to say about it. Just a second. Um, oh, that we can all. We're all. Can be world disclosers on our own more mini way. You don't have to change the whole culture. I mean, it would be nice if the way I teach wasn't just mastery, but really was a different way of teaching, and that my students could learn it. I think it might be, and it's funny, it's so Heideggerian, though I never knew it from Heidegger. Heidegger says that to be a teacher is really to be a learner, and that's certainly what it seems to me. I wouldn't teach for a minute if I wasn't learning something in any, every lecture. And, uh, but it, maybe that's changing teaching, maybe it's not, but uh, I can, I'm sure that in very concrete ways people can be fathers, or teachers, or lovers, or musicians, or whatever, in a way that changes, not, that doesn't do it just with, uh, with mastery, which is enough, of uh, doing things that are uh, uh, so appropriate that nobody's ever noticed them before, and, uh, but the, that actually change what it is to be uh, whatever, <laughs> and, and, and what that domain is, it must happen at every level, and Heidegger thinks that it's the basic feature of human beings to be world disclosers. Well, that could be the, in the domestic world, in the business world, it doesn't have to mean the whole culture. That uh, being a world discloser is the highest thing we can be. Heidegger gets it from Nietzsche. Can you explain, yeah, just in the yeah. last two minutes that we have, uh, what it means to be a world discloser, like just defining the term of... Well, okay, and that is the highest thing you can do is it, come up with some new way of doing, of, of playing the game if it's basketball, of what counts as painting if it's, if it's painting, of what counts as being a teacher if you're being a teacher. You change the, uh, the subject, so to speak, whatever it is, but it's still recognizable as painting somehow, or basketball, or whatever. Uh, so you think, but you think that, that Heidegger would only call the that this person who's gone past expert uh, called them a world discloser? Do you no, think no, anybody who's responding to the situation, and even like a, an expert, is, is being a world discloser? No, I think they're not. I think Heidegger's got a category for uh, this kind of radical innovation which world disclo disclo dis uh, but aren't disclosing we is supposed world to be. Disclosers? I mean, isn't everybody. Ah, I see. Oh, well, that's an interesting thing. There's two different meanings of world disclosing going on, totally different. In Being in Time, Heidegger hasn't thought of this story that we're telling at all. Expert uh, is the highest you get, or maybe master, let me think. Uh, master. Uh, his model is the Greek phronimus, though, who is has had so much experience and learned so much from it that he does the appropriate thing at the appropriate time in the appropriate way and even though people don't recognize it at first they say ah oh, yes that was what should have been done that's how far Heidegger gets in being in time no no he gets a little further but he doesn't call it world disclosing he says that there can be people who take up marginal things in in the current practices which uh, come down to them from the history of the culture and uh, make them crucial and change things. They say Martin Luther King taking up practices of love and, and of justice and really transforming our view of race relations or something. Heidegger has a sense of that, but he doesn't have a sense of... Uh, and, and we are all world disclosers, and it's complicated. We're all world disclosers in some basic way, according to Heidegger and being in time, just in having a world. And everybody has a world in being in time. Uh, that's just having 
a, fami a familiarity with how to find your way around and, and do things and relate to people. And of course we all are, are that. But then, then he has at the very end of being in time the idea that there are sort of special historical people who are uh, more than just opening up a way of encountering entities and encountering other people that talk like Heidegger, but are, are changing and renewing history. And then later he has this different view that a world is a certain style of acting with, with, I think, and that you can, people are world disclosers in the, this, potentially world disclosers, because they can change the style of the game. And that he didn't have in being in time at, at all. Okay, perfect. perfect. There goes the bell. And there I